Hey everybody, back here in the lab again, um, and let's kind of revisit our physical system that we were working with, um, which was the red spring. And at one point, previously, I had a one kilogram mass hanging from the red spring, and it stretched by quite a bit, as you can probably see. Um, here I have a white spring, and I don't know if you noticed before I put the mass on there, but their unstretched links are the same. So they start off looking like they're the same, but when I put a one kilogram weight on this thing, notice that it doesn't stretch as much. Now, the weight that I put on there would still be proportional to the stretch, and so you would still get a straight line graph, just like we got for the red spring, but it would have a different slope. And so remember, we called that slope the spring constant. It's a measure of how stretchy the spring is. A higher spring constant would correspond to a stiffer spring. So because the same force doesn't stretch the white spring as much as it stretches the red spring, we could conclude that the white spring is stiffer. It would have a higher spring constant. And so if I took data for the white spring and I graphed it just like we did the other um, day, I would get a steeper slope on there. If I had like a trampoline spring, that would be a very steep slope. Um, and so springs are actually really, really important in physics. One, they allow us to measure forces. And so if you have a like scale, I'll go grab one in, in a little bit and show you. If you have a scale like to weigh a fish or to weigh yourself or something like that, um, it's simply a spring inside of there. And when you stretch the spring, it moves a dial around, and then it points to a pre-calibrated scale behind it that tells you how much your fish weighs, or how much you weigh, or how much your truck weighs, or whatever the case may be. So all of our ways of measuring forces are built around this idea of a stretch spring next to some sort of scale, like a meter stick. So last kind of thing to mention, and, and you probably, in a lot of cases, already thought of this, this meter stick is just kind of arbitrarily taped next to the springs. And I didn't really worry a whole lot about where zero was. Zero is way up here, way above even the top of the spring. Now I could have taken my meter stick and chopped it off so that zero could be right here. Or I could have taken all my numbers and subtracted the original position of the red spring, which is about 43 centimeters. And what that would have done is I would have moved all of my dots closer over to the origin, like over here. And that would have been good. That probably would have made it easier to figure out the y-intercept, but it's not necessary. And that's kind of an important lesson I want you guys to see off the bat. The starting point for a measurement is usually arbitrary. Like, it doesn't matter where you start as to how far you have traveled. And so, by not worrying about where we started from, I'm still able to figure out what that spring constant is. It just shifts my graph over to the right. And you're going to see that a lot in physics. Like, where zero is, quote unquote zero, is really an arbitrary thing. And so, you can play games with, all right, I'm going to subtract 43 centimeters from all my numbers and then my line is shifted over, but that doesn't really have much effect. And so in this case, the y-intercept that we calculated doesn't have much meaning to it. That 12.9 newtons that we calculated for the y-intercept, that's just the fact that I didn't start zero up here. And so if my spring had started up here, we would need 12.9 newtons of weight in order to stretch it to our starting point in our lab of about um, 46 centimeters. And so understand that a lot of times what your y-intercept is or your starting point is arbitrary. Sometimes it is important and we'll see some examples of those later on. Last cool thing to, to illustrate with springs, put the one kilogram weight on here, um, if you displace a spring a little bit, kind of like this, and you let them go, they will oscillate. They will move in a regular repeating pattern. And that regular repeating pattern is really, really useful. Um, one, I can use it to tell time. So this is like kind of what's going on in a normal watch, more or less. Um, two, I can use it to model other things 
that repeat over time, like the motion of the planets, for example, or 